Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Pamela Godia. I lecture at the University of Nairobi School of Public Health. I'm also part of a team from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, the Kenyan office, where I coordinate their maternal and newborn health program, specifically maternal death, maternal and perinatal death surveillance, MPDSR, together with the Minister of Health. So I'm happy to be part of this team, and I'm happy to make my presentation today on the confidential audits of, or confidential to inquire into maternal deaths in Kenya and specifically focus or uh, focusing on uh, an aesthetic related deaths. So I'll introduce my team. I don't know whether they are, they are able to hear me. I know you are able to hear me. Dr. Charles Ame. Hello. <clears throat> able to unmute your mic. Hi, hello everyone. Good to be here. Okay. So Charles uh, is an obstetrician gynecologist and is uh, also a clinical lecturer at the Department of, and the Deputy Head of International Public Health at Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine in the UK. But um, he works uh, most of the time with the Kenyan office. He's often more in Kenya than he's in the, U in the UK. Next, uh, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Jacqueline Adoga. Are you in the team? If you could unmute your mic. Yes, I'm here. Your video. Yes. I'm here. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm so ready. thank you, Jacqueline. Yeah, so Jacqueline is a consultant and anesthetologist and lecturer at Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Mathias Zakech. Dr. Matthew Zakech. Okay, so Dr. Ma Ma Matthew Zakech is also part of our team and uh, he's uh, an obstetrician gynecologist and a senior, uh, senior lecturer at uh, JKU at uh, School of Medicine. So I will go straight to the presentation. I'll just share my screen. So, are you able to see my screen clearly? Yes. Yes, okay. we do. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, this is just uh, what has been uh, on the screen as you are joining. So my topic, uh, our topic today is uh, about uh, confidential and, uh, and specifically focusing on uh, maternal deaths that occurred after mothers had uh, maternal deaths associated with the anesthetic uh, related uh, exposure uh, during their time of stay at the at the at the health facilities. So we will be looking at. Uh, maternal deaths reviews that were that were conducted on on the deaths that occurred between the period 2015 so this is the outline of my 
presentation, uh, give you some information on the background, key results, uh, background methods, key results, uh, demographic uh, uh, analysis, uh, clinical characteristics, uh, part of the health systems, uh, issues that uh, we identified in the, in the study, quality of care, case summaries, and a discussion and a conclusion. So this slide is just gives to give some background on, on the importance of maternal health. It could be a common slide to most of us who are in the maternal health field. And there's basically the global strategy for women, children and adolescent health is, uh, runs from 20, 15, 2016 to 2030. And the, it's, it's, it mainly outlines the sustainable development goals and for health, uh, the Sustainable Development, Development Goal 3, uh, main objectives is eternal deaths in terms of survive, number two, thrive and transform. So in, in ending maternal, in ending preventable deaths, ensuring the, the health and well-being of the population is, is, uh, is ensured and expanding, expanding in the enabling environment. So with the sustainable development goals, uh, the targets I've just flagged out some of the three key important targets uh, for reducing maternal mortality to less than 70 per 100,000 live births. So that is a target uh, most countries have been given by 2030. And for neonatal mortality, uh, the, the target is 12 uh, per 1,000 live births. And um, ending epidemics of AIDS, TB, malaria, and also achieving universal health coverage. So, looking at the maternal mortality, uh, global and uh, regional maternal mortality, uh, this slide just compares um, when the Millennium Development Goals were being uh, discussed and what where we should have been by 20. By 2015, and where we were, uh, Kenya compared to the neighboring countries, East Africa and the, and, and Uganda, Eritrea, and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa in general. So, based on what what we can see there, uh, with regards to Kenya, we've made very slight change. Uh, not sure whether that is a, a, whether that is significant. So, when it comes to uh, maternal uh, uh, maternal, confidential inquiries into maternal deaths. What, what, what were the objectives of uh, confidential be looked at within the context of quality, provide, provision of quality of care for mothers and babies, whereby there are four key, four key approaches which can be used to uh, address issues of maternal quality of care in maternal deaths. In mat health so one of the one of the uh, one of the approaches is facility based maternal deaths this is where facilities are able to to conduct the maternal deaths um, uh, identify gaps within their uh, general environment and come up with local solutions for addressing those gaps so those are uh, an approach that is uh, carried out at the facility level and um, we also have community-based uh, maternal deaths that uh, communities that, that uh, occur, maternal deaths that occur in the communities that are undergo review, and that's what you call verbal autopsy. And then um, uh, we have the near misses, uh, and then now confidential inquiry into maternal deaths. So for confidential inquiries into maternal deaths, uh, you are looking at uh, uh, reviewing either all the maternal deaths within the, the country or within a geographical area or a specific sample of those maternal deaths and uh, having an aspect of anonymity such that the people who took care of the mother uh, are not essentially the ones who are conducting the, the reviews. So the aim of the confidential inquiry into maternal deaths is basically to reduce morbidity and mortalities occurring during pregnancy, childbirth, and the preparatory period by improving quality of care at health facilities. And the objectives, uh, the objectives are what to conduct uh, a confidential in into inquiry into maternal deaths to determine the underlying cause of death, determine the quality of care provided, 
identify factors associated with the poor quality of care, make recommendations, and uh, uh, most importantly, monitor the implementation of those, those recommendations. So uh, what methodology did we use to do this? So for the confidential in, in, inquiry into maternal deaths, we, for, the, for Kenya, we've, we've had two reports. The first report was uh, uh, used as a pilot to see how the process can be implemented to a review. And this report, which I'm presenting, uh, 2015 and 2016. So basically, to, it was uh, we used a multidisciplinary team. Uh, there was an aspect of anonymity and confidential review of maternal deaths that were reported in the Kenya Health Information System for the two years uh, from the national and the major referrals. Um, the reviews were conducted between the period 2017 and 2018. Uh, then the underlying cause of death were assigned using the WHO ICDMM classification and associated uh, cause of maternal death were identified using the three delays, three delays model. So overview of the CMD process. Um, so this, this process begins by identifying where the where the where the maternal deaths are and our of reference is the kenya health information system so we go into the health system and identify maternal deaths that have occurred within a specific period of time so for this case it was maternal deaths that occurred in the major referral hospitals between the years 2015 and 2016 so once we've identified the facilities where these uh, maternal deaths have occurred that like the ones that have been reported in the system um we we use the the team from the ministry of health to support to support the process uh, specifically the Re department of reproductive health to uh, to retrieve the maternal deaths from the from the health facilities maternal case notes so we get the files the uh, health facilities uh, we get the copies and the copies are uh, received at the mpdsr secretariat ministry of health and in 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 that uh, uh, at the at the Ministry of Health, they go through the anonymization process. Anonymization is where you re we remove the uh, identifiers, the names of the health facilities, but uh, leaving in place the levels, the names of the health providers that took off the, took care, took care, took care of the mothers and uh, any other identifiers like like the unique number. And uh, then uh, the, the, the files are compiled and go through a multidisciplinary assessment, a review of maternal death through regional workshops. And these are, the assessors are basically health workers, um, either midwives, uh, obstetricians, um, public health uh, professionals who are drawn from the major referral hospitals and the take them through um, uh, a series of trainings and they're now able to the assessors used to uh, review the files and get details and then uh, and that information from the assessors form is uh, entered into the into a, a, a form or either hard copy or I, ipad uh, using the, the survey CTO uh, platform, and of course, after that, it goes through the in, the um, usual pr process of analysis and uh, report writing, and the cycle continues. So, what are some of the key findings that uh, uh, were arrived at uh, in this uh, in this review? So, with regards to identification of uh, uh, maternal deaths that occurred uh, and the retrieval of files. Um, Looking at the existing information, all maternal death cases through the Kenya Health Information System, the, the aggregate platform for 2015 and 2016, uh, they reported 2,191 uh, maternal deaths for the two years. 
And then uh, looking at the major referral hospitals, like uh, we selected 125 um, referral hospitals based on the level of care. So maybe these would be the national teaching referral hospitals, the provincial hospitals, previous provincial hospitals, level five uh, hospitals, uh, county hospitals and sub-county hospitals. And those who actually voted um, um, uh, deaths in, in the system. So we got a total of 158, 1,583 1, files, uh, but we managed to retrieve uh, 1,359 files out of that. And out of that, we are able to assess uh, 1,334 uh, and analyze this. The rest of the files from the 1359 that were retrieved a majority of the some of them that are not included in the, the analysis were the information they had scant information and hence we are not we were not able to 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 use them for analysis so looking at the age distribution uh, of maternal deaths assessed between the period of 2014 and to 2016 so in this presentation, I, in some sections, I will be trying to compare and see a trend between 2014, 2015, and 2016 where, where appropriate. So age distribution, uh, looking at the time period 2014 to 2016, and uh, not much of a difference uh, between uh, the three years, um, because like for, for mothers who are less than 20 years, uh, it ranges between nine and 10% for the, across the three years. And uh, you, so majority of the deaths uh, occurring between the ages of 20 and uh, 34 years. Then, of course, we have a few cases of mothers above, above 45. So if we look at the maternal deaths uh, for 2015 and 2016 now, the, for the two years, which were totaling to 1,334, one, uh, if we look at um, the mothers who received uh, anesthesia or who were exposed to anesthesia at the time of stay in their hospitals, we find that uh, almost 41%, uh, so 40 where there's yes, so 40.5% 40, 40, 40 uh, of the mothers were exposed to uh, anesthesia one way or the other. So, and the number was 540. So if we look at uh, the type of anesthesia received, uh, over almost 70%, it's a uh, general anesthesia, spinal anesthesia, 22%, uh, and uh, not recorded 57, uh, 11%, sorry. 57 is the number, 11%. Uh, there was no record to show what type of anesthesia. Uh, bearing in mind that we were, we were using records, so, so we could only uh, record what is available in the files. The total number of pregnancies. Um, so um, uh, my my network shows that is unstable. So if I'm if I, I drop off or uh, you are unable to hear me, kindly let me know. Yeah. So total number of pregnancies for uh, anesthetic related deaths versus total number of deaths so this one we are looking at uh, for the mothers who who who, are, who had uh, exposure exposure to anesthesia versus the total population of the mothers who died between the two years so no, no much of a difference uh, so but we have a significant uh, number of 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 mothers who are, who are having their first pregnancy uh, almost uh, over 20 percent, uh, almost close to 20 percent also were having their second pregnancy and still we have a significant number here of oh, almost 20 percent also who, who's, uh, who are having this, uh, six pregnancies and above. So if we look at uh, anesthetic related deaths and number of ANC visits um, versus the total. So here we see uh, the records showed that 27% had uh, between one and three visits 
and uh, uh, as opposed to 41.1 percent photo but still there's a big chunk of uh, files here uh, whom we were not able to to group in the different uh, uh, number of visits because of uh, no records um, availability then an aesthetic related death and the uh, ANC tests performed um, majority of the mothers have uh, their blood group HIV and HB status uh, uh, taken or assessed, uh, but uh, very few have uh, urinalysis assessed, uh, random blood, sugar, and uh, malaria. Just describe, just looking at the blood blood group types. Uh, majority of the mothers. Uh, Report uh, uh, having blood group O, then uh, type B uh, at at twenty two percent, then uh, type A at twenty three percent, and uh, uh, type AB four percent and four percent. I mean four uh, percent also no 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 record. Um, HB status, HB status, uh, we think we used uh, N as a cutoff. So 9.9, 28% uh, and majority were above, above 10. So looking at the, the files and seeing uh, the referral pattern, uh, you see that uh, among the, uh, the cases, uh, the maternal deaths who, the mothers who died, um, having experienced uh, some find uh, some exposure to anesthesia almost half half of them over half of them 54 54% uh, were referred uh, and but 45% uh, were were not one did, didn't uh, go through any referral process so looking at the level of referral facility um, level of referral facility a majority is sub county hospitals and the health centers and dispensaries combined. Then, uh, uh, county hospitals uh, stroke level five hospitals, uh, 20%, and the uh, private health facility, uh, 10%. Mm -hmm. And the uh, faith based hospital, 6.2%. National referral hospital also had some some component of referral there. So if we look at the place of delivery, uh, majority of uh, the mothers delivered in the, in a health facility. So a few, a few less than 10% at home and 1% uh, on uh, en route. Uh, less than 5% no, had uh, uh, no record of referral. They were referred, but the records were not available for for the, for us to categorize appropriately. So, anesthetic related deaths uh, and level of uh, delivery or treatment. Um, so, majority of the mothers were were deliver, were treated in the county level hospitals and the sub county hospitals and national teaching and referral hospitals. So maybe this could be because uh, with this slide, the, the majority of the, the facilities are generally county, county hospitals. So uh, that would explain why we have a, a big number, uh, almost half percent, 50%. So anesthetic related deaths and uh, Anesthetic related deaths and uh, condition of woman on admission at place of death. So this uh, this slide came into uh, this aspect of uh, uh, the files were assessed uh, after a recommendation from the previous 2014 report, where it was there was discussion that. Uh, Maybe majority of maybe the mothers who are dying in our facilities, majority of them are coming late. 
they're coming late when uh, the healthcare provider has uh, nothing much very, or very little they can do to save the, the mother. So we included this uh, in the subsequent review to find out, okay, what was, the, what was the condition of these mothers as they're coming into the facilities? Are they stable, are they unstable, or are they, um, are they totally unstable and unconscious? So we find majority of these mothers who are coming into a facility, 61% uh, are in a stable condition, and 20% uh, 20, 20 uh, you'll find them in an un un unstable but conscious uh, uh, situation, and 17% of those are in unstable and conscious, unstable and un un unconscious uh, uh, situation. So, so that the, that explains uh, uh, that kind of uh, uh, helps us explain the condition of the women as they are entering into the health system. Status at the time of death, pregnancy status at the time of death. Uh, most of the women had had uh, delivered their babies. Uh, Ninety-two point six percent. Mm. And delivered uh, was contrib contributed by 5.2%, and then we had a few 1.3% um, uh, abortion cases. Uh, anesthetic related deaths and uh, mode of delivery. Mode of delivery, majority uh, had uh, a cesarean section, uh, normal delivery. 15%, uh, assisted vaginal delivery 2%, and uh, so majority of the mothers had uh, cesarean sections. Then for the normal deliveries, is the mothers who uh, have normal deliveries, but some uh, uh, well, because of one reason or another, they end up in theater because of one complication or the other. So if we look at the procedure, anesthetic related deaths and the type of anesthesia by procedure, uh, type of anesthesia uh, for cesarean sections, uh, majority of uh, the mothers had uh, go through general anesthesia, and then spinal anesthesia is 20% uh, and 8.2% uh, uh, no record. So from this slide, we can say that uh, type of anesthesia uh, is mainly general anesthesia. Uh, 40, 40, almost 47 percent for cesarean sections, and 12.5 uh, percent for mothers who have had normal deliveries. But because of complications, they they end up going into theater. So if we look at anesthetic related deaths and timing of emergency and timing of death, uh, timing of emergency. Uh, majority of the uh, anesthetic related deaths emergencies are uh, around the intrapartum period and postpartum period. Uh, but time of death uh, majority are postpartum period, almost over 80%. Uh, anesthetic related deaths and timing of deaths during the postpartum period. So for the mothers who died uh, uh, during the first period, we kind of tried to 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 to, to find uh, after how long or during what uh, time frame after the after delivery did they did they uh, did they die? So majority of the mothers, almost seventy percent also, uh, that is sixty seven sixty seven percent, are dying within twenty four hours, and then. Uh, close to 6% uh, between 24 and 48 hours, and 18.6% um, uh, between 48 hours and, and two weeks. So if we, are, um, we have to do interventions, we know we are where to intervene within the first, within the first 48 hours. So if we put our interventions uh, within the first 40, 40, 40, 24 hours, you should be able, or within the first 48 hours, you should be able to say to save 70% of the mothers. Then anesthetic related deaths and access to ICU or HDU. 
Mm, access to HDU. Uh, Yes, uh, 73%. Of course, we didn't, uh, we didn't, uh, it was kind of just having a snapshot of trying to see whether these mothers, okay, if they were, they had complications, maybe at one point or another, they could have benefited from ICU care. So did any of those, uh, did any of them access um, ICU care without really trying to find out whether it was uh, whether it was recommended and uh, or whether it was prescribed and uh, whether it was uh, whether the mother accessed or not, but just trying to find out generally whether the mothers had access to critical care. Then uh, anesthetic related deaths and period of deaths uh, uh, for the 2015-2016 files um, case notes, uh, you find that ma majority of the mothers. Uh, are uh, dying uh, out of office hours. Uh, out of office hours uh, is weekday out of hours, uh, Monday to Friday. Then weekends also a significant proportion. Then weekdays, uh, working hours, 25%. Uh, so this could be uh, important. This could be important in terms of looking at the. Uh, the staffing staffings you know majority uh, of the out of office hours or weekends or public holidays that is when we, when we have very thin staff so most deaths occurred outside outside working hours so if we look at the anesthetic related deaths and the highest cadre of staff involved in the market Office uh, are the first uh, majority of them are the first line of contact, sixty-two point four percent, and the obstetricians thirty-five thirty-five point nine percent. So this 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 slide looks at the highest cadre, highest cadre. You know, majority of the mothers when they come in, they will be of course they will be seen by the midwives, but uh, the slide looks at the highest cadre. So. Uh, Anesthetic related deaths and uh, time interval between admission and the medical doctor review and specialist review. Yeah, so there was concern. There was concern that we need to assess how long does it take if a um, if a mother comes into a facility, how long does it take for her to be reviewed by a medical doctor, or how long does it take for the mother to be reviewed by a specialist? But specialist, not generally, but when a decision is made for specialist review. So for the medical doctors, on average, for less than uh, 30 minutes, it's 21% uh, uh, of the mothers are seen by a medical, uh, a medical doctor uh, within uh, 30 minutes and 11% uh, uh, by a specialist. Then we also have a, a significant proportion here of uh, mothers who are seen long long hour, long before long okay they take long longer longer than two hours to be seen by either medical doctor which is 24 uh, percent and 54 percent 50 percent by specialist care so underlying cause of death uh, for the mothers who had uh, exposure to anesthesia uh, majority Majority of the deaths were due to obstetric hemorrhage, followed by the hypertensive disorders. Um, and anticipated complications of management, 10%, and non obstetric complications, 80%. So obstetric hemorrhage takes uh, half of the uh, uh, maternal deaths. So looking at other contributing conditions, other contributing conditions or other pre-existing conditions, uh, so these would be conditions which not necessarily caused the death, but uh, contributed to uh, the death in one way or the other. So there's anemia, uh, 51 percent, and uh, HIV, 6 percent, uh, cardiac disease, and uh, neoplasms and malaria, 4 to 2 percent each. So looking at associated factors, uh, using the three delays model, so we were looking at associated factors re related to the um, the health 
the health workforce, the administrative the administration, or uh, infrastructural, and also community factors or patient-related factors. So one or more associated factors were identified in 85.9%, 80, that is 86% of maternal deaths. Um, then health workforce-related factors were identified in 90% of the maternal deaths. And some of the factors which were identified included delay in starting treatment, um, a prolonged ab abnormal observation without action taken, incomplete uh, assessments, uh, inadequate monitoring, inadequate use of uh, monitoring toolkits like the pathograph, and also inadequate clinical skills by the healthcare providers. Infra infrastructure associated factors related to the infrastructure uh, or uh, administrative uh, infrastructural problems, e.g. operating equipment, backup, uh, availability of operating equipment, backup generator, were also some of the factors that were identified. Lack of availability of blood transmission services, lack of trained staff on duty, uh, where most uh, were the most administrative factors identified. Then uh, anesthetic related deaths and administrative uh, associated factors. So if you look at the administrative uh, associated factors, you have infrastructural problems, which you've talked about in the previous slide, uh, lack of availability of blood transfusion, uh, then absence of uh, trained, uh, trained staff on duty, and then lack of lab facilities, uh, transport problems, and also communication problems, uh, including interpersonal com communication between uh, the different cadres or the different staff. So anesthetic related deaths and health work worker associated factors uh, were also identified in, uh, in most of the, most of the uh, maternal deaths assessed. And this included included prolonged abnormal observation with no action. Um, I think this is just what I talked about in the previous slide. In the previous slide delay in starting treatment, inadequate clinical skills, but uh, yeah, inadequate monitoring and uh, initial assessment, uh, incomplete assessment, lack of obstetric life saving skills in a few of them, and uh, lack of teamwork was also a major, was also a factor. But uh, issues around uh, monitoring uh, clients, uh, taking appropriate action when, where, where it's needed, and today in starting treatment uh, were, were the, main, the main factors um, you know, that were identified by the others. Now factors related to patient uh, community level factors um, it's delay in reporting to a facility or delay in decision making. Decision making to go to the facility, or maybe a client is referred and uh, they are not able to to go immediately. They go back home and go back uh, to the facility after a few days. Yeah, so that 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 kind of delay. So we'll go to summaries of case studies. Summaries of case studies uh, will be presented by my colleague, uh, Dr. Jacqueline. Adoga. So, Dr. Jacqueline Adoga, you can take the floor. I will, uh, I think I will. Uh, yeah, Pam, just will, move to the next slide. So, as Pam is moving to the first slide, eh, um, I hope you can all hear me. Okay. As Pam is moving to the first slide, um, a lot of the questions I'm seeing is related to how did you get the information that you are presenting? So as she explained, in the process, after they receive the files, they remove all the identifiers. Now they have a team of assessors. The assessors are not, they're healthcare workers, but they're not necessarily anesthetists. It has all, any healthcare worker in any team. So it is not only, there's actually very few, if any, anesthetists. We're probably like two or three. Yeah? So we need to remember that an assessor is supposed to extract the facts from the files in regards to the patient care. After they get these facts from the file, they analyze the care provided to this patient from admission to the time of death, 
then is when they come with a reason they come up with a reasonable conclusion on the cause of death and any other associated factors based on those files so i was supposed to i'm supposed to talk about some of how they extract and some difficulties related to some difficulties related to getting up some of these files based on the document which we feel and some of the documents filled by other healthcare workers. So if you can just look at that anesthetic chart, I want us to look at it from being an assessor, look at it from an assessor's point of view, so not necessarily as an anesthetist. And I've just a few questions to see the difficulties they're having. If you look at this particular one, you cannot even tell the condition of the patient pre-op. You cannot tell if this patient received GA or spinal. There is a lot of missing data that makes it difficult for the assessor to determine what's going on with the patient. We can see there's some BP missing and the person has just crossed. So is it that the person did not record or was it that the blood pressure was unrecordable at that time or the person was away? Look at the SPO2. It is not recorded. So when it comes to determining the status of the patient before, you have to probably rely on other notes elsewhere, the nurses or the referral notes. Determining the status of the patient intra-op, if you look at it, is also not quite easy from what they have put even as an anesthetist for us. And also determine, de deciding that why did this patient require life support? Now, these are some of the cases she's talking about when they say either we cannot capture or we do not know because the person has referred for life support and yet, we do not know why this particular patient required life support, because if you look at it and you're not an anesthetist, it looks like everything is okay. It also makes it difficult to determine, was this care adequate or inadequate? Because there's a lot of missing information, yeah? If you look at the next one, Pam, you can go to the next one. So this, the first two were to highlight the importance of having complete and proper recording. This is an example of another chart that this is the chart that we were provided with to try and understand and determine what happened in theater. I think this is even more self-explanation. It explains itself. If you look at the missing information, drugs, gases, what's up with the airway, fluids, it's very hard to tell. And this is a patient who died after exposure to anesthesia. So it's very hard to determine, is this a death directly due to the anesthesia or indirectly due to anesthesia. And if you noticed, there was no analysis on if the anesthetic death is a direct cause of anesthesia or indirectly due to anesthesia. We cannot reach that part with the amount of information we are given. If you look at the next chart, if I move to the next one, this is how we determine that the next chart ideally is a cadex. Let me see, yes, it's a cadex. Now let's look at this. If you can read, you can read, but I'll quickly summarize this particular chart. It highlights the contributing factors by administration. Eh? So one, patient arrives at 7.40. The patient has a pH, is in shock. They note there's no blood. Patient is reviewed, they say for theater. At 8 p.m., patient is ready. At 8.40, they call theater, they're like, theater, what's up? Theater says, there are no instrument. At 8.50, they call again theater. Remember, this patient had shock, a pH, there's no blood. At 8.40, they call again. 8.50, they call again. Now, this time, theater says, there are no packs and there are no gowns. At 9 or 7, finally, remember this patient came at 7.40, the patient is wheeled into theater. They say the patient is alert, febrile, and weak. At 9, um, 9.42, I think, finally, the patient has an MSB delivered. And then, oh, that was at 9.12, I think. I actually could not tell the time, if it's 13 or 43 or what the time is. But of worth noting, at 9 or 7, there's a delivery Yet at 9.45 is when they decide to do a hysterectomy. So you see, it takes another 40 minutes. So it's two hours, 40 minutes into the management of an APH shock, no blood patient where there's no blood. And that's when another doctor comes in and says, let's now do a hyster, subtotal hysterectomy. This is probably like an hour after delivery. Yeah. It's 40 minutes after delivery. So this shows a delayed in decision making and also a lack of skill. And this is where we get our like human resource factors because there's a lack of skill if you have to wait 40 minutes for someone else to come and do the subtotal. And then now there's a continuation of surgery 
and we can't see the rest, but you see, there's still no blood. So from 7.40, I do not know the time of death, but you can see two hours later in an APH is when we are able to do a subtotal, which was something that is, it's not really, it's not rare in such cases. So this particular one was supposed to show how contributing administrative factors were being analyzed. Next slide, please. In the next slide, in the next slide, when we talk about referrals, ICU, and what's their importance, the importance was basically related. Sorry. If you look at this particular one, and you can read it very fast, this is a 45 year old primary gravida reported to a healthcare center, yeah, with vaginal bleeding. They had never attended ANC. On examination, the blood pressure is very low, 65 over 50. The pulse rate is, um, I can't see very clearly what it is, eh? but they've also, it, it looks low like 54 or something. So of important noting is the patient has an HB of 8.8, .8, is put on IV fluids. So the patient, they decide to refer. And this is probably, uh, they, they do not indicate the result of referral, but I think it's related to, they cannot manage a HB of 8.8, .8, probably because they do not have blood or something, or maybe it's a facility without a hospital. And so if you look ahead again, Sorry, I get interrupted by messages. So if you look ahead, at arrival, arrives at sub-county hospital two hours later. So from health facility to sub-county hospital two hours later, yeah, patient is bleeding. Patient was received and prepared for emergency CS, ready in 20 minutes later, but anesthetist not available. The CS take, oh, and so CS. the anesthetist not available and CS, what is that? Uh, Yes, not ready. Patient will to theater. However, CS done 40 minutes later and MSB extracted. So you can see all this delayed here. You can see the delays. After they finish again later on, you can see they now decide to refer to an ICU. You can see if this patient, as, as, as Pam said, if we intervene early, this patient would probably not have required an ICU. Now, if this patient actually got to go to an ICU, the patient would probably not necessarily survive, but have improved chances, yeah? Probably if we had intervened earlier, would not even require that ICU. But as usual, in, in some hospitals, they refer to an ICU. And you see, five hours later, they still have not found an ICU and this patient dies. It is important as an outcome measure and a quality of care, just to highlight how shortages of ICU can be contributing factors to deaths. Next, next slide. So if you look at this particular slide, no, before that. Yeah. This one, the one, um, is it that one? Yes, this one. Okay. So yeah, unless you, are, you want the next one, you want the next one? Yeah. So this is the, this particular slide I call a series of unfortunate events. If you look at this one, no, the one before, please. The one with electricity. Yeah the one with electricity. So this particular patient is a patient who arrived with a low blood pressure. This one, I call it, it has all the contributing factors. There's health worker factors, there's administrative factors. The nurses document very well, and this is why it's important for everyone to document, because as I said, you have the notes, you have the pre-anesthetic review, you have the referral notes, you have the nurses cardiac, and when you're assessing, you have to add them all up to understand what happened to this patient. So if you look at this patient, this patient was in shock, was unstable, and then the patient goes into theater, has poor reversal. After that, there's no electricity. Yeah, there's no electricity. At that, some point, there's no oxygen point to put the patient. The covering is still trying to sort out the blackout. So this just shows, it's, it's, it's highlighting how you arrive at contributing factors related to healthcare workers, related to administration, and probably also resources, just resources to be able to handle such a situation. And you're seeing it continued from 11, 11 p.m. all the way to 2, 2 p.m. or even beyond when the patient was declared dead. Next one. Next slide. Come. Yeah. In the next slide, you can see clearly this person has written over several places 
everything is undetectable. They have written something, but what exactly are they communicating? They have written on top of other things. And so it's very hard to pick up some of the things. I can hardly even read most of them. Anything they're asked, including the, I think the fundal height, they just write unrecordable, 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 undetectable. So it's nice to write something to allow the assessors to come up with the facts that allow us to conclude something. Next slide. So in this slide, um, okay. This is another slide that shows decision making, the timeliness of decision making and the timeliness of starting treatment. So a 38 year old primary gravida admitted at a county hospital, high blood pressure, swollen legs, referred six days earlier. So this particular one, you see the patient was referred six days earlier, but arrived late. So this is one where the patient also, there's a delay in going for healthcare. She now comes in in very poor condition, gasping pale. So the doctor sees the patient and asks for the obstetrician to see. And then also ask for full hemograms and ask for transfusion. There's no blood, there's no FFPs. Four hours, 20 minutes later, the patient now gets maternal distress. Oxygen is occupied. So there's no space for, there's no oxygen point, so to say, to put this patient. That's four hours later. Still, after that, two hours later again now is when these people decide, let's fix two IV lines. I mean, the patient has been there for like six hours and more. Eh? So now they decide, let's fix IV lines, IV fluids. Yeah. 25 minutes later, finally, they get blood. Yeah. So if you look at this particular case, yeah, so um, they get blood. The doctor who consulted the obstetrician and despite of poor condition, decided to take the patient in for CS 20 minutes. So you can see when, when, when you see like that, so these are notes written from the facts of the, fa from the fact of the, fa on the file, and you can see some level of coercion that despite the poor condition, there's no resuscitation, the patient is still taken for a caesarean section. Yeah, and basically a perimortem CS is conducted because the baby survives, I think, and the mother doesn't. If you look here, there's a lot of delay in making a decision, making a diagnosing, and starting the particular treatment that is supposed to be started for this particular patient. The next slide. I think that's the last one. Okay, so that's all. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Jackie, for that. Uh, uh, for that, uh, we are almost coming to end, to an end. So I would just um, like Charles to talk on this slide, uh, factors associated with the uh, uh, anesthetic related maternal deaths among women who received anesthesia but died 2014 and 2015. So here we, we are also trying to look for associations between uh, the different factors, trying to see whether there's any significance in them. So this is actually a work in progress. But uh, Charles, do you want to say something, uh, one or two things about this slide? Yes, um, I just want to say thank you for the presentation and I just want to thank everyone for the very active um, discussions that have been taking place in the chat room. And I just want to emphasize that, um, you know, what, we're, what we have done is to use a standard methodology um, to conduct reviews, generate um, hypotheses, um, which can help us, you know, investigate further. So we can also look for potential associations. Um, so what we have done with a subset of this data, just looking at the data, uh, uh, combined data for 2014 and 15, um, comparing all women who had anesthesia at all um, as part of their treatment, um, so that will be um, uh, no. And then those women for whom the multidisciplinary team concluded that their death was primarily um, you know, um, due to anesthesia. So that will be the yes um, column. Um, so when we look at this um, using chi square to see whether there is any association, um, you begin to see some you know, very interesting things. Also note the amount of uh, missing data, but when you look at um, a type of anesthesia, um, you see that there is a significant um, association between um, type of anesthesia and anesthetic um, related debt. Um, 
uh, debt on the operation table also has a significant association. Other significant association um, include timing of debt, blood received, um, so probably insufficient blood received, but you know that has a significant as association, um, and also the period of debt, whether the debt occurred on a public holiday, outside normal working hours, and all of that. So these were where we had significant um, associations in um, women that died. And then just to emphasize something that has come up in the discussion, a woman may have anesthesia as part of their treatment, but the primary underlying cause of death is not anesthesia, okay? So those whom the multidisciplinary team concluded that their cause of death was primarily was anesthesia, it's a small number. But I think some of the things we can take away from this presentation and what we can do something about almost immediately is the quality of documentation. Um, documentation is key to quality improvement, okay? So without good documentation, we cannot improve quality. And I think it's upon all of us to um, you know, do those documentations um, properly, um, use our surgical safe uh, checklist, um, you know, use those interventions that have been proven to reduce the risk of death. So somebody has talked about um, early warning score chart, which is really good for, um, for monitoring um, patients perioperatively, postoperatively, and all of that. And of course, the need for adequate blood transfusion. Um, by the time we're given one unit of blood, is either the blood is inadequate or it is not needed. I mean, you are an aesthetist, you know this uh, much better than I do. Um, so I think these are the key messages. And then we need to look at, you know, what do we take from here? What other things do we need to investigate um, so that it leads to quality improvement? So in the interest of time, I will stop here. Happy to take questions. Pamela, thanks. So I will uh, finish in the next uh, the three minutes just on the key messages uh, uh, from the presentation. 41% uh, of maternal deaths were anesthesia related, uh, just to show that uh, the women had exposure anesthesia. 22% um, spinal and uh, two thirds had general anesthesia, but no record in 11%. Lack of standardized record forms uh, needed, uh, need, uh, hence the need for electronic, de uh, electronic data. 54% of anesthetic related deaths were referral, referrals, and 61% uh, of the, the women were admitted in a stable uh, condition. 80% um, had uh, B results, and 7% uh, had system sections. Then majority of the deaths, 67% uh, of anesthetic related maternal deaths occurred less than 24 hours after death, hence need for improving mon monitoring post immediately post delivery. 23% uh, had access to ICU, HDU. And then most deaths occurred uh, outside working hours. And then 21% and only 11% of anesthetic related maternal deaths were reviewed by within 30 minutes by medical doctor and specialists res respectively. Primary underlying cause of death was obstetric hemorrhage in 51% of all uh, anesthetic related maternal deaths. And then anemia was a major contributing condition in, in anesthetic related maternal deaths. So I think, uh, thank you very much. I will end there. Thanks for LSTM uh, for your technical support and also for DFID for funding the project and also acknowledgement to Ministry of Health. So I think I, I will end there. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pamela, for very for that very insightful presentation. Uh, I can uh, can see the there's a lot of activity on the on the chat room and also on my phone uh, private uh, chat. Uh, a, a lot of concerns, a lot of uh, uh, queries which we'll try to address in a, in a few. Uh, time is quite gone. I, I think at this point I will just uh, request the, the representative from the Glenmark Farmer to come and uh, spend a few minutes uh, to talk to us and then from, we'll go to the question and answer session. Glenmark, yeah. Yeah. Uh, good evening everyone. Good evening to you.
Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, for giving us an opportunity to present today. I would also like to thank all the KCS members for attending this particular webinar. So my name is Saurav. Uh, I am the marketing head of Lumma. Uh, I have got some few slides to present. So uh, it is said that. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear, but your volume is a bit low. Kindly uh, just, try. Just one minute, one minute. Okay. Let me just speak up. Okay, thank you. Uh, you can see the screen. Yeah. So when, when life doesn't go as planned, uh, a little help may be what your patients uh, would require. So we have... Uh, help to turn your patient's world into a bundle of joy and help your patients believe that something wonderful is going to happen. So in uh, one in four pregnancies end in miscarriage. So, you know, these are the few feelings that a patient can have. I felt ashamed. I felt like a failure. I felt like I would never be a mother. So we have introducing a ray of hope in pregnancy that is LMW inox. We have got all the four strengths, LMW inox 20 milligram, 40 milligram, 60 milligram and 80 milligram. So the, the beauty with LMW Inox is we have got four different color coding system and it comes in a pre-filled syringes uh, from USFDA approved plan. We have LMW Inox 20 milligram, LMW Inox 40 milligram, LMW Inox 60 milligram and LMW Inox 80 milligram with, with different color codes. Apart from this, we have recently introduced Glen C, which is vitamin C effervescent tablets which helps to your patient to boost immunity and see the difference. So these are the few products uh, that we are having uh, today from Glenma. So we request your valuable support for especially LMW Inox and uh, Glen C. Thank you. All right, Thank, thanks yeah. for that uh, uh, very uh, precise uh, uh, presentation. Now, at this juncture, uh, I would like to uh, we go to the, the question and uh, answer session. Uh, lots of questions have been raised, lots of concerns have been raised. But just to try and summarize it, I know uh, Dr. Charles Ame has really tried to respond to most of them, but uh, I would like him to still go a little bit further and try to, I think the, the ambiguous terminology here is anesthesia-related death. That is, that is what is not clear. So I would like to, for him to come and uh, try and uh, elaborate, because when we have, uh, let's say, a maternal mortality, we have, uh, we, we have the surgical aspect, we have the obstetric uh, aspect, we have the anesthesia uh, aspect, and then, like Dr. Ngugi has mentioned, we also have underlying, sometimes underlying or uh, predisposing medical conditions like malaria, we have HIV, we have anemia, uh, we have a uh, multiple gestation and all these. So how, what exactly is anesthesia related mortality? Dr. Charles Ame and your team. Yes, um, <coughs> thank you, um, Dr. Kuria. Um, so what we have uh, tried to do is to use a standard methodology that essentially involves a multidisciplinary team um, that usually will involve um, all related specialists, including anesthetists, um, to come up with an underlying cause of death and find out what, what associated factors they, they, they are uh, that may have contributed to that death and make a judgment on the overall quality of care on whether you know, um, uh, that uh, death could have been avoided um, you know, uh, with some modifications of um, practice. It could not be avoided by any means. There was no substandard of care and all of that. So you know, this is how it comes about. So what we have done is take a big group, um, all women that received anesthesia um, but died. And then there's a subgroup where, we, where the, the group working on this determined that you know, this small group of women the primary underlying cause of death was related to anesthesia, okay? Um, so, so these are the two big groups. So 
with this sort of analysis, you know, we can come up with um, things that can be modified or changed immediately. You can come up with um, further studies that need to be done and, you know, with more in-depth analysis to find out exactly, you know, um, what caused this problem. So um, essentially, you know, this sort of um, analysis may not be um, have, the output is not uh, primarily causative, you know, A cause B. They may be associated and all of that, you may need to look further. However, you know, um, uh, in terms of coming to conclusions, it's a multidisciplinary team using a predefined framework. Um, so I don't know if this um, sort of um, explains um, you know, what, uh, what was done. Now, I put in the chat room, you know, so the big framework to use is the WHO ICD-10 MM, uh, you know, um, classification of deaths that occur um, in pregnant women. Um, and this has nine categories. One of the categories is on unanticipated, unanticipated complications of management. And that's where anesthetic related, one of the subgroups there will be anesthetic related death. So this multidisciplinary team, you know, will pinpoint, you know, as close as possible where this death lies. So a woman may have had anesthesia, anesthesia did not kill her, but hemorrhage um, killed her. And when you unpack that hemorrhage, uh, yes, hemorrhage killed her, but, you know, the primary reason was that, you know, the, the surgeon, you know, probably was not skilled enough to control it or, you know, there was insufficient blood. Yes, hemorrhage happened. They did everything they could have done. But, you know, when it comes to the point of adequate blood transfusion, they eventually stopped the hemorrhage. There was no blood, you know. So everything is looked at to pinpoint as close as possible, you know, those, those things that couldn't be modified, you know, to improve outcome next time. So I hope this um, explains and clarifies. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, clarification. But uh, when you are still on it, I think another concern that I'm seeing in quite a number of the charts is uh, when we have uh, when we have related factors. For instance, uh, someone has mentioned a patient comes in bleeding from home to a health facility and uh, needs uh, surgical intervention. So already this patient is uh, is a high both surgical and anesthetic risk, and. Uh, Anesthesia is administered and the, the, the surgery carried out, but uh, this was a patient who was doomed even before uh, the both surgical and other, uh, anesthetic interventions were done. So for purposes of improving the system or, and uh, trying to reduce uh, maternal mortality, when it looked like it's labeled as anesthetic death, how are we going to improve on some of these pre-anesthetic factors that also need improvement? Back to you. Yeah, so thank you very much. So I really will encourage everyone. Um, I know this is an anesthetic conference, but seriously, the intention is not to blame the anesthetist in any shape or form. Okay? <laughs> so let's look at it this way. Um, a woman comes, so th the way it will be looked at at the inquiry, a woman comes, so we even look at, um, you know, the condition in which the woman presented, and then a judgment is made that even in the best, with the best of facilities and all of that, um, you know, applying all the guidelines, you had 10 consultants, everybody there, you know, what are the chances that the outcome will have been different? So that team makes that kind of judgment. So you may have come, you know, in a very bad state, resuscitated properly, got on the operation table, and something went wrong during surgery, or something went wrong, you know, during general anesthesia, you know, so all of this will be looked at. Now, one of the um, big limitations to the confidential inquiry process, there's a key bit of information that is not usually there that may, that will have helped, you know, the assessors. If you had, for example, an autopsy report. So that is not there. So this group of experts are using all the documentation they have from multiple sources to sort of um, trace back exactly what has happened and looking for ways things could be improved rather than to blame one person or the other. So I think this is what, um, you know, we, this, uh, this is the way I would like us to look at it. And then, you know, like what we've done in Kenya so far, you know, there's a, the data set is huge and there's a lot of information there. And, you know, I think people are encouraged to come up with hypotheses that they want to investigate further, which may even include 
talking to people um, to identify exactly, you know, what else can be done in addition to what um, has been identified. I hope that helps. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you for that response. Uh, another question from one of the uh, participants is, uh, this is a, a lot of data. This is a lot of information. So what are some of the forums where we have the public health specialist and, the, and some of these practitioners, whether it's anesthetists, the, the, the obstetricians, meet? Because this is a confidential inquiry. So where is the interface where the, the, the practitioners get to consume this data for purposes of improving the outcomes? Um, I can I can respond. Then I will hand over to Pamela, um, sure. and I think you know she 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 will speak more. So um, th this work started you know probably since um, 2005 2006, and um, initially you know um, the reports have been presented to the COGS conference, and several large health conferences in Kenya. Um, um, and there's even also a national MPDSR committee with stakeholders from, you know, different partners all supporting health. So this information has been fed into various, um, uh, you know, um, uh, stakeholders. And um, even with the first report, you know, there's a detailed action plan which has been rolled out at county level, national level, and all of that. In fact, as a result of the initial analysis, you know, um, we had developed, you know, an extra um, training course to support the quality of um, uh, caesarean sections, anesthesia. Uh, I think Jackie can say more about um, what she thinks about that course and how she and other colleagues have contributed to rolling that out in Kenya. Thank you. Pamela, you want to add? And then Jackie. Dr. Pamela? Yeah, so I'm, tr I'm trying to mute my mic. So thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for everyone for the, your contributions. Thank you, Charles, for the uh, explanation. And uh, thank you, everyone, also for the chat that is uh, very active, as you said. So in, in terms of consumption of this data, actually, this, this, uh, this, uh, this process is uh, spearheaded by the Ministry of Health, the D Department of Reproductive Health. The reports that we produced are Re Ministry of Health reports. So the first report that we produced uh, was launched by the Director of Medical Services uh, sometimes uh, in 2018, and uh, that has informed some of the some of the interventions that the Ministry is uh, undertaking at the moment. Uh, specifically in uh, reviewing uh, the guidelines for mat maternal and maternal and perinatal care, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's that process which is ongoing, um, and it's the, the consumption is actually with the healthcare providers uh, at the at the at the local level, and uh, this the information has been disseminated both at national level. Uh, with the national teams and also at the at the county level with the county reproductive health teams, so I, I would say that uh, it's 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 a process uh, that is ongoing, and uh, currently we have, as Charles had said, we ha we have a national uh, MPDSR uh, committee which is housed at the Ministry of Health, and that committee is is it's also the one that approves. Uh, this uh, national national report, but for for today's presentation, we only uh, we only looked at one aspect one aspect of, of of the report, which there's a bigger report which looks at uh, the maternal deaths generally, uh, without necessarily looking teasing out information for uh, related to anesthesia. But for 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 today's re for today's presentation, our main our main aim was. Uh, to come and uh, uh, share the findings with you, stimulate discussion around uh, uh, how how we can improve care, both as uh, uh, holistically involved, in, including the anesthetist team. As uh, Jacqueline has, has said had said in her previous uh, presentation, uh, the anesthetists that are part of this 
team of an, uh, assessors a, a few. So it's st stimulating that discussion and uh, getting people to be in to be interested in um, in the in 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 the aspects of improve, improving uh, quality quality of care. So I think I would I would I would stop there unless there's uh, any other. Yeah. Yeah, there is okay. Sorry, there is a there is a still as an additive to that. Yeah. Uh, I guess this shows where the the major bone of uh, contention was, or rather, where it was not very clear. In in regarding the the relationship between anesthesia and death, is okay. it possible maybe in a report that it's not here to know exactly what the nitty gritty is? Is it that there was no oxygen? Is it that the the mode of anesthesia was not the right one? Or is it that there was no certain skills for the anesthesia provider? Could, could such information be available in maybe some parts of this report that someone is interested to know if that's possible? Mm -hmm. So I think that is some in, in that information. That information is there. It just needs to to dig up into the data and find out uh, uh, find out uh, whether uh, the specifics. But uh, for for the for the report. For our report today, it, it it doesn't mean we are not presenting, as Charles has said, we are not presenting findings of mothers who we died because of, because of anesthesia. Yeah, I hope I hope I hope that is clear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, yeah, clear. Thanks, thanks, uh, Doctor Parker. Hello. Yes, clear, very clear. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah, like we get so, to, because we get there's to. a slide I presented which showed which showed that majority of the mothers also who died in this report, uh, majority of the deaths were due to uh, obstetric hemorrhage, over 50 percent. And if you look at uh, mothers who died from complications related to anesthesia, were were 10 percent, 10 percent of that. Oh. So, okay. so yeah. All right. Uh, uh, one more quick one. Where has has, uh, do we have postmortem report mm. in, the, in this uh, in this in this data? Paxton. Yes. And, 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 unfortunately, uh, most maternal deaths uh, there are very few postmortem reports. So you'll you'll find very few postmortem reports in, in in these files. So okay. Yeah, so All it's right. not it's not done. It's not done. There are very few. Can I right. add Thank that? You. Yeah. So, so, so what we sure, have. Sure, sure. Go ahead. Korea, can I just add to what Pamela said? Go ahead, go ahead. So, what we have done, if you have access to the full report, after the first report, we have listed, you know, all the data sources that were included and, you know, um, report cumulatively on the availability of such data sets. So, for example, you know, if we need an autopsy report, um, was it there, was it not there? antenatal cardex, was it there, was it not there? Somebody had anesthesia, was the anesthesia report from there or not? Um, because this is also a okay. way to help improve the advocacy for improved quality of data and um, data collection instruments. Um, so it is not always there. Um, one of the things that is really lacking universally uh, autopsy reports. Okay, sure. sure. Uh uh, like like uh, it's been said, we we it's a loaded report, uh, a a lot a lot of information in there, and uh, it might not uh, all of it might not come out clearly in one presentation like this. So I guess maybe there is need to have a, a future more presentation to elucidate on some of these uh, uh, gray areas. Jackie Antoga, you wanted to say something? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, I think. I it seems like 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 the term anesthesia related death is probably not preferred by most people but just to capture that as fred says if you try and read about there's a difference between an anesthetic death and an anesthesia related death yeah the term anesthesia related death as you said is very hard to define and there are various definitions the constant in most of those, so either anesthesia-related death or perioperative death, are usually used to define anyone exposed to anesthesia. The variance comes about when they talk about the duration. Some people will say exposed to anesthesia 
anything between, some people would say as, as early as three days, other definition up to 30 days after death. So that's when they use perioperative death or anesthesia related deaths. Now, when it comes to an anesthetic death, that is something different. So when we talk about the anesthesia related deaths, they are further classified into two. There's the death due to the act of giving the anesthesia and there are other factors that are not related to the anesthetist. If you look at most of the data, including this one, and as Pam presented, most of these deaths were still not related to the anesthetist, yeah? You find that factors related, I don't even think this one was even, the one that was, you could evaluate the data, find no other cause of death other than the anesthetic, the act of giving anesthesia. I don't even think it was 10%. I don't remember if we reached there. Yeah, most of the deaths were still related to the underlying disease. So when you have deaths other than the anesthetist, that's where you have deaths related to the underlying disease, deaths related to other diseases the patient may have had, deaths related to a surgical mishap, or deaths related to other post-operative events. And still, that came out clearly in the sense that nowhere in the presentation did they say that these, these deaths were directly due to anesthesia, neither were they anesthetic deaths. So there's a difference between the word anesthesia-related deaths and anesthetic deaths. These weren't anesthetic deaths. In addition to that, when Mirori asked about were there data from other places without anesthesia, when people write their referral notes, if you write there, most people do not write reason for referral, and that's why we go back to documentation. At times, they might write referral reason HB8. But in few cases, and as Charles says, if you go to the original document, you shall see it, they will actually write their reason for referral, no theater available. Either the theater is busy, sometimes some people actually write, theater is busy, or we do not have a working theater, or there is no oxygen, which then you can see it goes to administrative rather than human resource. Uh, Dr. Chokwe said, was talking about the data on facilities and anesthesia workforce presentation, maybe at a later date that can be explored. But I just wanted to capture that so that people understand they're not direct anesthetic deaths, they're patients exposed. And that's, there's no standard definition. The only thing standard about the definition is all of them are exposed to anesthesia. The time by which they die is the one that's usually is conflicting depending on where you get the definition from. So yes, we need to work on a better definition and operationalize the definition if the data is supposed to go any further than this. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Andoga, for that clarification. Uh, it's, uh, someone is raising their hand to ask a question. Please go ahead. Uh, the name has just disappeared. Someone was raising their hand. They can ask a question. Joseph Ekugo, ask the question. Joseph? Uh, yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for <clears throat> giving me the opportunity. My name is Joseph. I'm from Uganda, an atheist, okay. but I work in Somalia. Now, I just saw something. I saw two um, basically talking in regards to the anesthetic uh, record form. I saw like two documents presented and they kind of have different uh, formats. So my suggestion is uh, maybe you could find, KCA could find a way to standardize the anesthetic documentation and that could help also when it comes to data collection. Anoga, Hello? What do you have to say about that? Um, I'll say that is true, I will tell you. The government has a standardized one, which is used by probably 90% of the government institutions. Then for some time, I hope you can hear me. Yeah, we so can there hear some, you. I'll tell you where the anesthetic chart had even less information than that. We have picked out those one particular one that, unfortunately, don't bring in this controversy. But it looked like it was given by the one of the ESM ketamine people, whereby I'll tell you all they had was the diagnosis. I think they put some of the two, three drugs. Then they were actually writing down the result, the, the, the find, documenting like every 15 or 20 minutes, I don't remember. 
And then at the end of it, there wasn't much notes related to anything else. There's an issue of standardizing the chart, and there's also an issue of enforcing to ensure everyone has sort of a minimum amount of information they collect in those charts. Redesigning your chart is not the issue. The issue is, do you have every single information that's supposed to go in that chart? If you look at the bigger private hospitals, they actually have all the information KSA requires according to their guidelines, plus more. But there are few hospitals here that are providing less information than that. That is what challenge that needs to be. All right, sir, thank you. One more question from Alfred Nasende. Your hand is up. Kaidi, go ahead and ask the question. Thank you so much. Uh, Alfred Nyasende from Migori County. I'm asking in terms of uh, these uh, mortalities that normally happen, they normally like uh, to, to say that it's an aesthetic death, regardless of what it is. Because most of the time you get that it's uh, through hemorrhagic, um, uh, through the bleeding, some of all these other complications in terms of, but they normally say an aesthetic death. So what can you advise uh, or tell us about that? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Charles, would you like to respond to that? Um, yes, so I, I was just thinking uh, how I respond to that. Um, <laughs> um, I, where, where do I say? So, I mean, I don't know. Maybe he's referring to um, conclusions that are reached at facility level when the reviews are done. Um, uh, and I just want to say, you know, go back to the principles of um, the whole maternal and perinatal death surveillance and response. So it's all about quality improvement, learning lessons to improve, and not about blaming or shaming. Um, uh, to, to be able to, to have enough distance between the actual case and coming up with, uh, you know, an objective conclusion as to what caused the death, what contributed to the death, what can be avoided, what, what needs to be improved at facility level can be very difficult because um, people are so close to the case, they know the case, they know who was involved. Things can easily sidetrack to a blame game and that is beyond the point. Um, when you take it to a higher level away from the facility where everybody involved in that review um, have no clue the name of the facility, the name of the healthcare worker involved. The best they know is that, well, it was a medical officer, a consultant was involved, a sister was involved, it came from a dispensary, it came from a referral hospital, that's all. In that, when all those sort of things are removed, you know, there's minimum bias. A multidisciplinary team tends to easily come up with, you know, the true picture of the quality improvement opportunities rather than you know, who to blame for what has happened. Um, so I'm not sure if I have adequately answered this question. I did not really get the question, um, but I, I hope this, uh, this helps. Thank you. Thank you very much. I thank you, everybody. Uh, there, there are so many more questions coming, so many related. These are a lot of interrelationship between the, the definition of terms or rather of, uh, of a rationalization of the ter terminologies that has i think the, been the biggest contributor in the in the chat room but the, again also what comes out clear is uh, a lot of uh, interrelationships from both the pre-hospital care to the intra-hospital care to the post-hospital care in terms of uh, uh, referral protocols availability of blood things like oxygen uh, surgical sets all those things all have a role to play in terms of uh, reducing uh, maternal mortality. I think I would like us to put a stop to it there. It's, uh, our time is much gone. And uh, at this juncture, I would like to really thank our presenters, Dr. Pamela, Dr. Charles, Dr. Jacqueline, and Dr. Matthias, for your uh, mm -hmm. hearted uh, re response to, to this uh, the discussion. There's a lot of uncovered grounds in this in this uh, regard, and uh, I guess as KSA, uh, it means we sh should plan to maybe have another series of this presentation uh, with the stakeholders, uh, the, the the surgeons, whether they are obstetricians or the general surgeons, so as to at least uh, make 
make clear on some of these um, terminology or some of these causations. I'd also like to remind all of us that documentation is everything. Documentation, documentation, documentation. Some of those charts uh, really are very incriminating. It, they have, we have so much missing. So as you pick up that chart, please put as much information as you can into it. I uh, want also to thank our, our partners, uh, Glenmark Pharmaceuticals for making it possible to uh, organize this uh, CME. Uh, one more reminder that elections are still ongoing for all the KFC bona fide members. Please look into your emails and do the necessary until tomorrow midday. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Shalmin, for hosting the CME. Thank you all for taking time to join us. Thank you for all the participants from the other East African countries and beyond. Asante Nisana, you have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.